How old are they? Are? How's it going? Oh, Fran. Hello, Fran. Thank you for following. Uh, the tour doesn't start for another 15 minutes, buddy. <laughs> I always try and come on 50 minutes early, however. The tour doesn't actually start until 3 p.m. Scottish time. How's Wendy and Deborah, Joanna, Vivi, Arte, Tracy, Matthew? Yay, Fran, how you doing? Thank you for coming on my tour. Thank you for following my channel as well. Much appreciated. How's it going? How's life? Where are you from, Fran? Hey, Jana. Welcome to Scotland. Scotland. <laughs> hey, Janice. Natasha. How's it going? Pennsylvania. Carry ER. Welcome to Scotland. It's a cold wind up here. Hi, Alice. Oh, my ears are cold. <laughs> it wasn't very windy down on the ground level, but up here it's quite windy, shall we say. <laughs> hey, Vanessa. How you doing? Can you hear? Can you hear the wind howling? The wind is howling up here. It's a really cold, bitter wind, wind actually. I've got a really good microphone, so it shouldn't be too bad. Hey, Agatha, how you doing? Welcome to Edinburgh. It's a cold wind blowing today. I'm glad I've not got my kilt on today. I'd maybe get frostbite somewhere. <laughs> Jesus, holy moly. Nice here, isn't it? We're quite happy. I'm standing on nearly at the top of an extinct volcano here. Hey, Bonnie. Can't get much higher than this in Edinburgh. Oh, Jesus, holy, hey, hey, Amy, Oregano, Amy from Oregano, or is it Oregon, Oregon, eh, uh, what, how do you see it? <laughs> the Americans see Oregano funny, herb, herb, <laughs> Oregano, <laughs> I can't remember now, I've confused myself, confused.com, <laughs> Do I have my kilt on? No, oh, you're having a laugh. I've not got my kilt on. It's bitterly cold here. The wind's blown a hooli, as they say in Scotland. <laughs> it's blown a hooli. It's actually not that windy down on the ground. So I don't know why. But mind you, I remember the first time I came up here a couple of years ago with my gimbal. I came up a couple of years ago in February. In fact, about two years ago. This month, actually, and I came up with a geology teacher to learn about the geology. And we got hit with 60 mile an hour winds. And the geologist said it was the worst wind she'd had for two years. <laughs> My gimbal just span round and round. The gimbal had obviously not been tested in Scottish weather. We are the windiest country in Europe. The Scots are tough. I'm a softy. Hey, Dan and Don. And Gloria. Welcome to Edinburgh. Has anyone been here before? Bonnie! Yes, I am on our first seat. I'm, I'm going to dedicate this show to Francis, a tour guide from Austria, who sadly passed away leaving a big hole in the Hago community. Hey Liz. It says rain's not forecast. 
That cloud looks quite ominous to me. It says it's going to stay dry all day, it says today. Dry all day, no rain. Yeah, right then. It rains 191 days of the year here in Enbro, Scotland. Hey, Carol. Look at the views. Lucinda. Pauline. How you doing? I'm punishing myself today on behalf of Francis. I'm climbing to the highest point in Edinburgh as a tribute to Francis. Who sadly passed away at the age of 57. Can you believe that? 57. How sad. Karen! Oh! They're getting blown over here. It's blown a hooey! I'm walking in the footstep of dinosaurs. Oh. Hey Christina, Bonnie, Adrian, how you doing my friend, how's life? Oh. Too young, oh what, 57 year old man, how can you be taken away at 57? I don't know, just running quite badly. Guys, just show you the views here. Hey, Todd and Jill. Bonnie actually got up okay, but he had gone back down. Kelly, Valerie. Hola, Morris, Tardes, Que Pasa? I can see my house from here. Who died at 57? Francis from Vienna. The Brazilian guy was on vacation and he had a heart attack on a plane. Hey, Hadrian. Joel, Sue. Look at, this, look at the views. Look at what I'm doing for you, everybody. I'm climbing to the highest point in Edinburgh. Up a volcano. This could erupt at any minute. <laughs> look. Look at Edinburgh Castle there. See the castle? Set on top of another volcano here. Hello, castle. Take some postcards if you like. Oh, Whew, it's cold here today in Edinburgh. Well, it's not that cold actually, it's just the wind. It's the wind that's making it cold. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It's like Jurassic Park here. <laughs> right. Hello, Cornelia, Steve, Gloria, Kathy. Welcome to the top of the world. Carol, Dan, we don't want you to have a heart attack. That's all right. I can clean this volcano in half an hour. Hi Lorraine, Gerald, all the places I go with you. <laughs> Just think man, there would have been dinosaurs here at one point. Look at that sky, are you trying to tell me that's not going to rain? 
It says no rain. Dry all day, it says. Aye, right. I believe that. Hey, Omar. Donna, Connie. Welcome to the top of the world. I can see the pub from here. Name that advert. Hey, Snally. I can see the pub from here. Witches, bitches, that's tomorrow. Witches and bitches, that's tomorrow. Oh, it's quite hard doing this with one hand. Look at this. Look at this, everyone. Look at the views I've done for you. Arsenal on the telly. <laughs> hey, Marty. Lalisa. Maud. Hey, Carol. Hey, me as well. Hello. How you doing? Welcome to the highest spot in Edinburgh. I've done this especially for you. Look at the views. This is the highest spot in Edinburgh. There's been people here for thousands of years. At some point, they decided to make the permanent fort on the castle there. See the castle? See Edinburgh Castle there? Look, the guy's head just popped right in front of it. <laughs> oh, it's cold up here. I've only got one glove on. Look. See, in the summer, if you come up here in the summer, there's hundreds of people here. And there's all these horrible flying ant things you get attacked with as well sometimes. Hey, Cynthia and Claudette, how you doing? Look at that sky, that looks like rain that cloud, doesn't it? You can see the Sassanacs coming from up here anyway. Well, Bonnie Prince Charlie took Edinburgh. You can see, I came up here last August and there was like hundreds of people here. <laughs> hundreds. Look, there we go. I'm on top of the world! Look, Stumbling Castle's over there, Fourth Bridges. Dalgetty Bay, Fife. The Firth of Fourth. How high? Oh, Christ, I've just forgotten. How high, my Metres. Just forgotten. 240 metres, is it? I've just forgotten. <laughs> Can somebody quickly, quickly Google? I'm too cold to think. <laughs> is it 280 metres? I can't remember, I've just forgotten. <laughs> Where is Holyrood Palace? I'll show you that. Oh. Hello, Bianca from the Netherlands and Benita. Carolyn, how's life in the Netherlands? One of my favourite countries is the Netherlands. I've toured all around, from top to bottom, north to south, east to west. That's the palace there, see the palace? See the palace there, that's the palace. 4,000 feet. Jesus, it's cold up here. It's like bitterly f icy cold. Look at this. Look at the views, but it's spectacular. You can tell why they came here and put a fort here. You can see the enemy coming for miles around. All directions. Bear in mind, this would all have been fields. Until relatively recently, actually. Only until a couple of hundred years ago, this was all fields. So it shows you how quickly the world's developed in a couple of hundred years, you know? A wee toddy. <laughs> I'll get a Glenfiddich 12 when I go home. Good morning, Carolyn. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time zone you're watching in. Because that's the beauty of Hegel, isn't it? You get people from all time zones, all continents, all climates joining a tour at the same time. Oh. Yeah, going down can sometimes be worse than going up. Hello, 8am, Thelma, Jen. It's just a puddle. Oh, what body of water? What, out there? You mean... That's the Firth of Forth. <laughs> Firth of Forth. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, <pray> me. <laughs> Scotland in August was cold enough for me. Yes, it can be freezing cold in August as well. Doesn't matter what time of the year, it can be freezing cold. <sighs> so here we go. How are you doing, everybody? Welcome to the highest spot in Edinburgh. <laughs> That's what we're coming for. 251 metres, that's what I thought. I thought it was 280 for some reason. 251 metres high. What is the weather like in May? Changeable. <laughs> the weather is changeable. Hello there, everybody. You can't see me because my camera's knackered, but hello, I'm here. My name is Paul. Whoa, that did man on top of that. Go on yourself, buddy. I used to do that when I was younger. <laughs> now I'm a bit older and wiser. Well, just not as daft right enough. Hi Sarah, the average temper this time of year, it can, it's, quite mild, it's actually been quite mild, so it could be anything from minus 10 to plus 10 Celsius. So I just thought I would come up here today to start the tour, I thought I would punish myself. Hello Norma, yeah I thought I would punish myself today, I thought I would come up to the highest point in Edinburgh on behalf of Francis T. Just in case anybody doesn't know, everyone, Francis from Vienna, the lovely tour guide, sadly passed away last week on the 13th of February. He was born in Brazil, but he moved to Austria as a child, became a licensed tour guide in 2020, toured all over the world, and unfortunately, well, he was on a flight live from my heart. It's such a shame. Such a shame for Francis. So I'm going to play a tune for him before we get started, everyone, okay? Before we get started, I'm going to play a little tune. And then we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the volcano. And then we'll go on to the Jacobites, okay? So bear with me, everyone. I'm just going to try and get this that set up. It's quite awkward being on top of an extinct volcano, one hand on a gimbal, the wind's blowing a hooli, <laughs> and everyone's looking at me as if I'm a twat. <laughs> one second, everyone. So there's the castle over here. So that's Edinburgh Castle there, directly in front of us in the centre there, see it? That's sitting on top of another extinct volcano. Yeah. One second, everyone. I'm just getting this. I'm just going to play a song for Francis, okay? Uh, which one is it again? Oh, I can't remember. One second. No, that's not it. That's not it. Mary of Soul, she sailed on a day over the sea to sky. Who was a stand from on the port? On the starboard bow, glory of youth, glory of his soul. Where is that glory now? Sing me a song, the last that is gone. Say for that last we Mary of soul, she sailed on a day over the sea to sky. 
Give me again all that was there. Give me the sun that shone. Give me the eyes. Give me the soul. Give me the love that's gone. Sing me a song of the last that is gone. Say, could that last be I? Mary of soul, she sailed on a day over the sea to sky. I've got that too soon up. <laughs> And seas, mountains of rain and sun. All that was good, all that was fair, all that was me is gone. Sing me a song of a last that is gone. Oh, 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 oh. Take that last be Look at the bumps! Look at the bumps! Picture, picture! Hey, sir. That was for Francis, everybody. Just in case you didn't know, Francis passed away at the age of 57. 57 year old. Gee, was holy moly, eh? Love each day to the fuel, everyone. You never know. You never know what's going to happen, eh? You never know what's going to happen in life, everyone. Live each day as you can. If you're suffering from any kind of problems at all, speak to somebody if you can. One second, everyone. Yeah, so I just thought I would do a wee tribute. I thought I would climb up to the top of the volcano for Francis. He's a very helpful guy. We joined Hego at the same time, actually. Francis and myself joined Hego at the same time two years ago. So it was very sad, so I just thought I would come up here today to the top, to the highest point in Edinburgh. So thank you very much. Is anyone here for the very first time? Just in case you didn't know what was going on there. That was a tribute to one of our Hegel colleagues who sadly passed away last week. We've lost a few voyagers as well, actually. And that's uh, the sad part about, you know, life moves on. He died on a plane. On a heart of a heart attack. He was in Brazil. He was born in Brazil, Francis. And he moved to Austria as a young child. But he regularly went home to Brazil and done tours there. And he tour leaders all over the world as well. And he was on a flight. I think he was coming home. I'm not exactly sure. But yeah, poor Francis. So welcome to Edinburgh, everybody. I'm on top of our first seat. I'm on top of an extinct volcano. It erupted probably around 340 million years ago, 400 million years ago, something like that. This is the highest point in Edinburgh. You can see the castle there. It sits on top of another extinct volcano. That's Edinburgh Castle. So that's the second highest point in Edinburgh there, the castle. Prince Charlie took Edinburgh. Stayed here for six weeks, but he didn't take the castle. 
he did take the palace of Holyrood. <laughs> a bit more luxurious, shall we say, in the palace. See the palace down there? So that's the palace of Holyrood. And that's where Bonnie Prince Charlie spent about six weeks. He also stayed down here as well, in Burnston Village, on the other side of Edinburgh. He stayed across here as well. But before we start talking about Bonnie Prince Charlie and the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion, which was, of course, the Sobite Rebellion. But what we need to do is we need to go back in time a little bit. We need to go back in time to the marriage of James IV of Scotland and Margaret Tudor of England. It was a way of trying to ensure peace between Scotland and England. But what that did was that gave the Scots a claim to the English crown through Margaret Tudor. And of course, the most famous Scots who I do tours about, so Mary Queen of Scots, her grandfather was, um, her grandmother was Margaret Tudor, her, her grandmother was Margaret Tudor, and her grandfather was James, King James IV, and that gave Mary, Queen of Scots, the claim to the English crown. But of course, Mary, Queen of Scots, was Catholic. And so the English put Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, the Bastard Queen, on the throne of England. And of course, we all know she died childless in 1603. Mary, Queen of Scots, gave birth to a son called James, who became King James VI of Scotland. He was born in the castle here. He was born in Edinburgh Castle. Thank you for the tips, by the way, on Laurent Palm as well. If you want to follow my channel, please, as well. Does everyone know how to take postcards? Is anyone here for the first time? My name is Paul, and sometimes I talk nonsense, okay? <laughs> so that's Edinburgh Castle, where Mary Queen of Scots gave birth to King James. And, of course, they're quite vital to the story of the Jacobites, actually. Because when Elizabeth died childless in 1603, King James VI, of course, she was responsible for executing Mary Queen of Scots. However, Elizabeth died childless, and James, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, took over the English crown in 1603. But of course, he was baptised Catholic, but then Mary was forced to abdicate when he was only 13 months old. He was brought up a strict Protestant. Of course, he translated the King James Bible as well. So when he became King of England, when Elizabeth died, he became King James the First of England, okay? He was a Protestant. His son Charles the First became king. He got his head chopped off as well. You don't want to be related to King James. His mother got her head chopped off and his son got his head chopped off too. And of course, Oliver Cromwell died, Charles II got back on the throne, and of course James the Seventh, the Catholic Stuarts, got back on the crown. The Catholic Stuarts, James, got back on the crown. But he, well he had actually secretly converted to become a Catholic for 20 years. He was actually supported by the English Protestants as well. So I think England was now, you know, it went through a civil war and so on. Oh, Jesus, holy moly. And I'm just um, trying to get down the volcano here and stay out the wind and not fall over at the same time. Hello, everyone who's joining. My name is Paul, and this is about the Jacobites. I'm just setting the scene. We're nowhere near the Jacobites yet, so don't worry. We've still got a bit to go. So what happened was, in 1688, the English were getting a bit concerned about the Catholic, James Stuart. So what they did was, they invited his son, eh, sorry, his daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, to take over the crown of England, Scotland and Wales, eh, and Ireland. It's called the so-called... It's called the so-called Glorious Revolution because there was no blood spilt. Well, until James fled to France, 
Right, and then what happened was, because he fled to France, the Scots and the English and the Irish said he had abdicated, he had def defected, he had given up, essentially he given up the crown. Okay? So then what happened was, James landed with 6,000 French troops in Ireland, and a battle took place in 1690, on the 1st of July, called the Battle of the Boyne. He's known as King Billy in Scotland. King William of Orange. King Billy. Dutch. He was Dutch Protestant, of course. How long does it take to climb up Arthur's seat? I can get up to Arthur's seat in about 30 minutes. 45 minutes. If you're pretty unfit, it can take about an hour. You just keep on having a rest, you know. There's plenty of places to stop on the way up. So we used to be attached to the equator when this uh, erupted. We were actually attached to Canada as well, believe it or not. Scotland and Canada were joined by the same landmass as anyone who'd have been on my haggish radio show this morning would have discovered. We split apart 400 million years ago. Scotland moved about and smashed into England and smashed into Europe until a tsunami cut us off 8,000 years ago. And we've been an island ever since, but it takes about 45 minutes. But you know the castle, Edinburgh Castle, right? It's sitting on top of an extinct volcano as well. So see some of this lava here. Some of the rock formation here has actually came from the castle. Because what happened was, at the end of the Ice Age, obviously things changed and moved. So see, I've just come from up there. Hello everyone who's joining, sorry if I can't, I'm just trying to concentrate on the story. It's supposed to stay dry today. It rains 191 days of the year in Edinburgh, so I'm not holding my breath on the fact that it's not going to rain. Always have your umbrella. As Billy Connolly says, there's no such thing as bad weather. It's just you wearing the wrong clothes. <laughs> So hello everybody who's joining my ch uh, channel, thank you so much. If you could please follow my channel, this is a tip based platform as well. Some people have already left a tip, so thank you so much. As you can see, the views change. You can see the palace of Holyrood where Bonnie Prince Charlie took, we'll come on to that story in a minute. See the palace of Holyrood, hey Fliss, 105 people. That's not too bad. I thought I'd have more on this, actually. I had more booked. So it's a palace where Bonnie Prince Charlie took. I'll come on to that shortly. We're just talking about the circumstances that led up to the Jacobite rebellions. Okay. It lasted for 57 years. <laughs> 57 years. So who was William of Orange? You see 120. Yeah, it always changes. It's never, it's never very accurate, this. So who was William of Orange? Well, he was the nephew of um, King James Stuart the seventh and second of, of Scotland, uh, of England. Because you've got to bear in mind, when James the sixth of Scotland took over the English crown, he became James the first. So James the seventh of Scotland was James the second of England. <laughs> it gets confusing all these dates and kings and queens. It can get quite confusing, so I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible for you all, <laughs> and and for myself as well, to be honest. <laughs> it's a very complicated period, especially the Oliver Cromwell period. That see the the War of Three Kingdoms and Charles the second and James the seventh and all this. It's it's, quite, it's taken me a long time for it all to fit in together, you know, because there's so much of it. So it is, it is quite um, complicated, to be honest. But don't get me wrong, the, the history, you know, the history before, like when Scotland and England were getting created before that time, you know, like the 6th, 7th, 8th century, 9th century, that period. God, that's so complicated as well. Trying to learn that is almost impossible, man. So William of Orange was married to the daughter of King James, the seventh and second. She was Protestant. Mary was her name. Mary was her name. Okay, so he won the Battle of the Boyne. James fled into exile 
And of course, the Battle of the Boyne is celebrated today on the 12th of July because Pope Gregory changed the calendar and Britain eventually adopted it in 1752. So time moved back 11 days. So the Battle of the Boyne took place on the 1st of July, not the 12th. Because today in Scotland, the Protestants, believe it or not, probably about 10% of Scotland support King Billy even today. But that's mostly for a, a soccer team called Rangers. They're all Protestant Orange Loyalists. But King Billy was actually acting, when he fought against King James VII on the Battle of the Boyne, he was acting, King Billy, although he was Protestant, he was actually acting on behalf of the Pope. He was following the Pope's orders. And King Billy is what we would call today, he was gay. He was gay. He obviously had a wife, Mary. But like James VI and I of England, he preferred the company of men. So we, they would get called today what we would class as bisexual. Obviously that word was not alive around at that point. So I hope you're enjoying the views from up here. I'll go over here. Try to stay out the wind, it's quite windy. Sometimes it's not too windy on the ground, but when you go up the volcano it gets quite windy. Was Mary not James Charles's? Yes. She was his daughter. She was James's daughter. Mary. Oh. To get the views. I'm just going to take you over here to get the views for a second. <coughs> oh, try to stay out the cold wind as well. It's freezing cold. <laughs> get the views here. Uh, quite dramatic looking skies, isn't it? So what happened was 17... Oh, so, aye, sorry, I missed like, the first Jacobite battle. So what happened was the Battle of Killycrankie, right? So the first Jacobite battle really was the Battle of Killycrankie in 1689. Right, and the Jacobites narrowly lost that, and the rebellion was put down. And then in 1692, one of Scotland's darkest ever periods, one of its darkest ever events, what happened was the Scottish clans were obviously, they still had the clan system, King Billy was the king, but the clan chiefs still had a lot of power in Scotland. So they put in an order whereby the clans had to show allegiance to King Billy and Mary by the 1st of January. And what happened was the Macdonalds went to Fort William to sign the, the, the treaty and they were, they were too late. They were too late, right? So then King Billy signed an order where the British troops were going to teach the Highlanders a lesson. So what they did was, they went to the McDonald's in Glencoe and they asked for hospitality. Now the Highlanders' hospitality was famous. Thank you, Amber. And so they basically, it was a way, if you turned up at a Highlander's house, they shared what they had with you, like their, their house, their heat, their warmth, their food, their drink. And so the British forces stayed there. For a while, it was the depth of winter. Then at five o'clock in the morning, the order was given to massacre everyone in Glencoe Village, including the women and children. It's not known how many were killed, possibly up to 40. Others fled into the mountains who were covered in snow and thick. The weather was horrendous. It's one of the darkest, darkest events in Scottish history. Why would a Scottish person celebrate a king that ordered the massacre of the Glencoe? And the problem is, because Scotland became part of Britain in 1707, we were hardly ever taught Scottish history at school. If you said to somebody in Scotland, when was the Battle of Hastings? They would tell you straight away, 1066. You ask them when the Battle of Preston Pans was, or the Battle of Falkirk, they would not know. We got taught another country's history. 
Isn't that mad? Thank you, Sarah. Oh, this, seriously, this can be a cue. I came up here last August, right? And all you could see going up was people. All you could see going up was people. There was actually, once you got to the top, there was actually a queue at the top. When you got all the way up to the nearer the summit, there was actually a queue of people. It got voted the number one walk in Britain. I mean, where else has a volcano sitting directly in the centre of Edinburgh? Well, two, three volcanoes directly in the centre of Edinburgh. And upon one sits a castle. <laughs> We're quite lucky here in Edinburgh. It's not quite the Taj Mahal, I know. It's not the Taj Mahal, but it's still not bad for a small country, five million people, you know. It's quite unique, I would imagine, of an extinct volcano. Thank you, you. Hey, Mark, how you doing, buddy? We're almost at the start of the Jacobite Rebellions. Well, we've started one, the Battle of Killy Cranky. Bonnie Dundee was killed, unfortunately. He was a great um, warrior, a great fighter for Scotland. And they reckon if he hadn't got killed, we might have had a chance of um, winning that battle. But 1692. That was the massacre of Glencoe. 1701. There's more the rebellion. So basically for 57 years, there was non-stop Jacobite rebellions. And what happened was, Anne Stuart got on the crown in 1702, because remember King James the Sixth, Protestant, well, Anne Stuart got back on the crown in 1702, and then in 1703, that's when England and Scotland joined to create Britain, okay? And then they brought in an Act of Settlement. Have you heard of the Act of Settlement? Okay, and that what that meant there was going to be no Roman Catholics could get on the crown ever again, and it was a way of ensuring that the Protestant faith would be maintained forevermore. The Act of Settlement, so no Catholics can get on the crown, and that Act of Settlement still stands today. Believe it or not, they did change it in um, was it 2003, 13, 2013. The Act of Settlement got changed. When Princess William and Kate got married, what they did was they changed the, you know, because previously the Act of Settlement went, meant it was the first, it was the male. Even if a girl was born first, the boy would become king. So when William and Kate was married, they changed it so it's the firstborn child. They also changed it whereby a Roman Catholic can now marry into the royal family. However, a Roman Catholic cannot have royal children, and a Roman Catholic cannot ever be a monarch. So as you can see, Britain is a sectarian state. No Roman Catholics are allowed to become king or queen, and there's no Roman Catholics ever being a Prime Minister as well. They tried to say Boris Johnson is a Catholic. He was baptised a Catholic, but he gave up, and he got baptised, he got christened into the Anglican faith, so he's Church of England. So in Britain, in the House of Lords, the Prime Minister has to appoint House of um, Bishops, Church of England Bishops, to the House of Lords. And the King or Queen as well is the head of the Church of England, right? The King or Queen, despite us sharing the monarch, they are not the, the King or Queen are not the head of state of the Church in Scotland. Only Jesus can be the head of the Church in Scotland, okay? So it's kind of complicated, isn't it? So then what happened was Anne died, right? Anne died in 1714. And because of the Act of Settlement, they bypassed 54 Roman Catholics. And guess what they did? They invited the German Hanoverians to take over the British crown, rather than the Stuarts, the Catholics. The rightful heirs to the British crown were bypassed. 54 Catholics bypassed. Get away! You're too papish. You're not going to become the king or the queen because you're a papist. So they went to the British colony in Hanover in Germany and invited George to be the king of England, Scotland and Ireland. He could not even speak English. <laughs> he couldn't even speak English. 
It was actually King George III it was the first Hanoverian king to speak English. How terrible is that? Imagine inviting the uh, Germans, uh, and even today, the British royal family are German as well. They are Saxe Coburg Gotha. They changed their name to Windsor at the outbreak of the war. So even today, the royal family are German, but they still have the bloodline from Scotland. They still have Mary Queen of Scots blood. So bear that in mind. And I've said it before, if Scotland ever does become independent, we will still have the same monarch. Right? So what happened was in 1714, when they bypassed all the Catholics again, that led to another outbreak of Jacobite rebellions in 1715. <laughs> As you can tell, quite a lot of Jacobite rebellions will happen. Hey Mike, how you doing buddy? I just thought I would come up to the Highlands of Scotland. Well, it's not really the Highlands, it's more like a for seat. Oh, in fact, by the way, Mike's got a good tour on. I've done a tour during the week there with Mike from Edinburgh. He's easier to understand than I am. <laughs> and we did a haunted pubs tour of Edinburgh. Uh, so just, just after this tour finishes, Mike is in a beautiful East Lothian seaside, seaside coastal town called Dunbar. Sunny Dunny, it gets called. It's supposed to be the sunniest place in Britain. And then... Um, Scotland. Oh. How you doing? When is the least busiest time to visit Edinburgh? September. September's a good time. So see, look, get the views. Look at this. Oh, Jesus, holy moly. It's a bit windy and rainy in Dunbar. <laughs> uh, so Sunny Dunny is not living up to its um, reputation then. It's supposed to be the sunniest place in Britain. Uh, in, uh, Scotland, sorry. Of course, many battles took place there. The siege of Dunbar, many battles of Dunbar. Hot, Hotspur, Percy Hot, um, what's his name? Percy Hotspur. Black Agnes. Oliver Cromwell. Quite a lot of history attached to Dunbar. Because after the English stole Berwick from us, Dunbar was the first town over the border. So please join Mike after this tour. So straight after this tour finishes, you can still stay in Scotland. How cool is that? See the things us Hago guides do for you, everybody. Hey, Emily. Hi, Mike. There's Mike's... Mike's put the link in the chat for you, everybody. If you want to go on to Mike's tour. Hopefully the weather will stay up, stay dry. Well, man. Get the views. Oh, some people are right nosy, man. Look at this. You see the castle in the background there? See the castle there? Take some postcards, by the way. You can take hundreds of postcards. If you like. Castle. Of course, you can just see the golden turd. You can see the golden turd, look. Can you zoom in? I'll zoom in. Look, look, see it? See it? See the squiggly turd? The chocolate jobby. <laughs> picture, picture. <laughs> so this ancient ruin is the St. Anthony's Chapel. They don't know how old it is. It got mostly destroyed during the Reformation period, but... The Pope sent money for a repair in the 1400s, so it's probably 13th century. It's actually, they don't actually know though, they, that because of the Reformation of 1560, they don't actually know a lot about the St. Anthony's Chapel. I'll show you a picture of what it used to look like. Obviously you've got the Abbey, you've got the Abbey in the Holyrood there. If you're on my Queen Mary's tour on Friday, see the palace? That's where Bonnie Prince Charlie took Edinburgh. He didn't take um, the castle, but he took Edinburgh. Spent a lot of time entertaining women. I think he was a bit of a ladies' man. He was described as an effeminate Italian gay boy. Bonnie Prince Charlie. He was born in Italy, right enough. The young pretender. His dad was the old pretender, of course. It's a nice, get a picture of it, get some postcards if you like. So it might have been linked to Kelso Abbey. It might have been linked to Leith, to St Anthony's. 
Uh, prob probably linked at some point to the Abbey as well, because I mean it's not going to be that close to the Abbey and not have a connection. But they also reckon it might have been a beacon for the pilgrims going to St Andrews. The uh, St Andrews was one of the top pilgrim pilgrims in the world. Only the Holy Land and the Camino de Santiago rivaled uh, the St Andrews pilgrimage before the Reformation of Scotland. So they reckon it was like maybe a beacon so people, sailors coming up the Firth of Forth could see it and come to Edinburgh before going away. Jacobite, oh sorry, yes, I forgot to see what a Jacobite was. Jacobite is Latin. Jacobus is Latin for James. Jacobus. So that's Jacobites. Jacobus. So my name is Paul James Stewart. I am a Jacobite. Is that a river behind the abbey? No, there was, there was a stream here. There used to be breweries here. No, streams. No, there's a lock down here. This is a man, in fact, Queen Victoria made this lock here. This is called, well, her husband, Prince Albert, made this lock here. St. Margaret's lock. See here? So that's man-made. Made for Queen Victoria to make it more pleasant. But yeah, so there's a major Jacobite rebellions in 1715. Obviously they failed as well. James Stewart, he did briefly come back to Scotland. Battle of Sheriff Moor took place. Some English Jacobites were executed as well. Then James fled back to Rome. He was given a, an apartment in the Vatican. He's buried in the, the Vatican next to St. Peter, the first Pope. In fact, one second, I'll show you what this chapel is. I'll just see a picture of this. Look, so, so that's what it would have looked like. So see the chapel there? So they reckon... That's what, thank you, Hadrian and Glenda. So that's what the tower would have looked like. As I say, it's definitely aged before 1426, because that's when the Pope sent uh, money to repair it. Leith, somebody's asking about Leith. Sorry about my nose, the wind is really bad today up the volcano. So Leith is just there. Thanks, Glenda. There's my house. See that building there? See the one on the right? Look, I'll zoom in. Say hello to my house, everybody. See the one there? That's my house. Hello, house. <laughs> Wave, hello. <laughs> it's the seventh tallest building in Edinburgh, and it's one of Edinburgh's most hated buildings. <laughs> Knock it down, please. I want a house with a garden. So you can see the Parthenon, a replica of the Parthenon there. Edinburgh looking, see Edinburgh even in the sky eh? they, that's the good thing about Edinburgh it's a very photogenic city it is very photo, oh thank you for sponsoring me I've got a new sponsor woohoo <laughs> thank you very much you can sponsor for £10 a month I think it is and we get 75% of that now so hey go increase the cut they only take 25% now so as well as tipping you can become a sponsor Obviously the tours are free to watch. A replica of the Parthenon, yes. It was supposed to be a Scotland's National War Memorial to celebrate the end of the Napoleonic Wars. But typical of the Scots, they ran out of money. <laughs> you see there, look at that. Let's try to get a nice postcard. See, if you zoom in too much, the quality goes down, but you know. So we're going to fast forward now to 1745. Yeah, they ran out of money. You couldn't finish it. Typical Scotsman. Aye, so what happened was 1745, Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, came to Scotland. He landed in the Glenfinnan with seven men. He had lost, he had previously tried to come to Scotland and lost some ships to a storms, to storms back in France. The France were supposed to be finan French were supposed to be financing him. You've got to bear in mind Europe was still mostly Catholic at this point as well. They wanted the Catholic Stuarts back on the crown. So Body Prince Charlie, as he was known, arrived in Scotland with seven men. He managed to raise an army of up to two and a half thousand. They took Edinburgh. A battle took place between the Hanoverian forces and the Battle of Preston Pans. 
just outside Edinburgh on the way to Dunbar. And that gave the Scots the confidence to march to London. They decided to march all the way to London to reclaim the throne for the Catholic Stuarts. Get rid of the German Protestant Hanoverians. Now, you have to bear in mind this. People think this is a battle between Scotland v England, Catholic v Protestant. There was English and Scottish on both sides. Okay, there was English Jacobites, Scottish Jacobites, there was Catholic Jacobites, but a lot of the forces, believe it or not, were actually Protestants in Scotland. The Episcopalians, right? After Scotland became a Protestant country, the Presbyterians took over from the Episcopalians and the Catholics, right? And the Episcopalians were not treated very nicely by the Presbyterians, so they preferred the Catholic Stuarts back on the crown. So there was mixed Catholic and Protestant on both sides. There was English and Scottish on both sides. There was also French, Spanish and Irish involved as well. Look at this, somebody's vandalised the ancient well, man. Absolute idiots, man. Why would you vandalise an ancient well? Look at that. Gee, this man. People have got no respect, eh? It's an ancient well. Look. Thank you for following my channel. Yeah, one way to help us, by the way, is to follow the channel. See the well? It's not been used for a few years. So Lord George Murray was one of Scotland's... Um, he, was, he was the commander. Now, you've got to bear in mind, Bonnie Prince Charlie told the Scottish Jacobites a pile of lies. He told them that the French were coming in vast numbers. They were sending more soldiers, ammo, weapons, money, and so on. It failed to materialise. Okay, so what happened was they marched down to London. Well, they started to march down to London. They took Carlisle. They then went to Manchester. By this point, they reckon there was up to 6,000 Scottish and English and Irish, French, Spanish, Jacobites marched into Manchester. Now, 300 only Jacobites joined Manchester, right? Because part of the reason the Jacobite rebellion failed was also the the fact that the French, Bonnie Prince Charlie lied about the French support that was coming, and the Jacobites didn't pick up enough support in England. They only picked up a few hundred. They did form a Manchester regiment with the Jacobites. Indeed, I found, uh, during my research the last couple of years, <coughs> I found, um, I managed to find the route that the Jacobites marched into Manchester. So they marched into Manchester and went to St Anne's Cathedral in the Deansgate area, right? And then they blew up the Deansgate area in Manchester. Sorry, anyone from Manchester, I wasn't there. And what happened was, they blew up the Deansgate area for target practice. <laughs> they had to practice their cannon fire somehow. So they blew up Manchester. Sorry, Manchester. <laughs> it wasn't me, I wasn't alive. Even though I'm a Jacobite, my name's Paul James Stewart. I am a Jacobite, but it wasn't me. I did go down to Manchester and I retraced the route. That's part of my research. And what I did was, I took a Scotland flag, it was actually the day before the Scotland v England soccer game, <laughs> a couple of years ago, and I went down to Manchester, I was going to wear my kilt, but I took a big massive Scotland flag instead, and I went with my gimbal on, a, on my tour, I done like a retrace the tour, the route on a tour, and you should have seen all the looks I was getting from the English with my Scotland flag, <laughs> it was so funny. But yeah, I went down to Manchester, the Chatham Library was still there. There's not much of the original Manchester at that time still left, but there is a little bit of um, the ancient part of Manchester. Not a lot, but I did go down to Manchester. So I'm actually going to go down to Manchester again and do a Hago tour from there. And what I'll do is I'll show you the route that the Jacobites took in Manchester. Fantastic. You can just imagine the people in Manchester. 6,000 hairy ass Scots have turned up looking for a battle. You're like, oh no, hide the woman, hide the, hide the woman and drink. <laughs> yeah? You'd be hiding all the horses, your shoes, they were trying to steal everyone's shoes. Women would be at risk, 
horses. They actually went through my hometown of Leaf the Jacobites and stole lots of supplies. They marched through Dumfries and stole all the shoes from my village. The villagers have never forgiven the Jacobites for stealing their shoes. <laughs> my shoes! You stole my shoes! <laughs> you imagine them all these big hairy ass Scots, eh? You'd be terrified, man. Be like a scene at a brief art. Freedom! All these hairy bum warriors, Scottish warriors trying to charge you. Surrender! <laughs> <laughs> so they marched all the way to Derby. <coughs> Very nice postcard for you. They marched all the way to Derby. And there, that's when it all went wrong. The Jacobites were split. Bonnie Prince Charlie wanted to move on to London. Lord George Murray and others wanted to turn back. They were terrified of getting cut off by the advancing Hanoverian forces. The French didn't turn up. They were all getting a bit cheesed off with Bonnie Prince Charlie. So, they decided to return to Scotland. They left some Jacobites in Carlisle, mostly English ones. Any English Jacobites were executed for treason. The foreigners were allowed to live, so the French and the Spanish, they were allowed to live if they got caught after the Jacobite rebellions were over. The Jacobites returned to Scotland. They won a battle of Falkirk. They won, a battle, uh, they won another battle in Falkirk. So they've won the Battle of Preston Pans. They've blown up Manchester. They've won the Battle of Falkirk. They couldn't take Stirling Castle. They failed to take Stirling Castle. I'll not be playing 10 pin bowling today with the pigeons. I've already pledged that to Hago. I will no longer play 10 pin bowling with pigeons. <laughs> I got pulled up for playing 10 pin bowling with the pigeons, man. <laughs> So the Jacobites failed to take Stirling Castle. Stirling Castle was quite a very well fortified um, castle at that point. So they retreated all the way to Inverness. And this is where Colonel Anne Mackintosh comes in. Have you heard, have you heard of Colonel Anne Mackintosh? Lady Anne Mackintosh. As the title says, she was a lady. She was a landowner. Her husband was a British Hanoverian officer. She persuaded, shall we say, some of her tenants to make her to join the regiment. She was given the honorary title of Colonel Anne. So her regiment joined forces with Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites at Culloden. Of course, Colonel Anne was not allowed to take part. But she was hosting Bonnie Prince Charlie one night. Right? She's got Bonnie Prince Charlie in her house. With a few supporters and servants. The British forces have heard that Bonnie Prince Charlie, the place is called Moy, just outside Inverness, it's called Moy. So the British Army have started advancing 1,500 forces, including Lady Anne's husband. He's thinking, oh no, that Bonnie Prince Charlie's trying to fire into my wife. I better hurry up and get home <laughs> before Bonnie Prince Charlie gets and fires his tuck right into his wife. So luckily a Jacobite supporter had got ahead of the advancing Hanoverian forces and they told Colonel Anne, you better get the king dressed, the prince dressed. So she says, right, she sent out a handful of men. She sent out a handful of men. She says, well, you try and hold them off and I'll get the king, the prince dressed and we'll try and make her escape, right? Well, it was pitch black, as you can imagine, right? So under the cover of darkness, there's about hand, a handful of Jacobites and their servants have went out with a drum and a gun. They've made that much noise the British Hanoverian forces fought the whole Jacobite army was advancing upon them and 1,500 men ran away from a handful of servants. Only one person was killed. The poor bagpipe player. Well, depends if you like bagpipes or not, if it was poor. <laughs> it was called the Rout of Moy. Can you imagine her husband? She was actually taken prisoner after the Jacobite rebellion of Culloden and she was going to get executed, but because she was a lady... Her husband was a, an officer in the British Army. She got off of it. She got off scot-free. She got off scot-free. She was only held in prison for a few weeks. So Lady Anne, she actually moved to Leith to my hometown. And then, anyway, back to Culloden, right? So the final battle, the last major battle to, took play, to take place on British soil, took place in Culloden. The battle was over in just over, over an hour. A 
two and a half thousand Scots, maybe three thousand Scots were wiped out, killed, massacred. Um, the Duke of Cumberland, the son of George II, was the cha in charge, the butcher of Cumberland, he became known as. And he said he lied to his forces. He said the Jacobites have given no quarter. And that meant if they lost the battle, everyone would get executed. And so he lied. See the bird over there? He lied and said that that's what happened. So he gave the order no quarter given. And that meant after the Jacobites lost the battle, what happened was the night before, the Jacobites had went on a night march and then they abandoned it, right? So the Jacobite soldiers were knackered. They were starving, freezing cold, hungry. And then what did they do? They'd done the famous Highland Charge again. They all got wiped out, man. The British forces were too well armed in comparison to the Jacobites. So the battle itself was not too bad, okay? But it was the aftermath. It was the aftermath of what happened next, because what happened next was genocide. The Duke of Cumberland was not given the title of Butcher Cumberland until he returned to England, and the English found out some of the atrocities that he'd carried out. They carried out a mass campaign of murder, rape and pillage across the Highlands, killing hundreds of women, children, elderly, rape. The act of prescription was brought in, they banned tartan, gallic, weapons, bagpipes, they wiped out the clan system. It would be classed today as genocide by the Butcher Cumberland. So today the Union flag in parts of Scotland is known as the Butcher's Apron because of the Duke of Cumberland, the Butcher Cumberland. It was a horrific period in Scottish history. And of course that led eventually to the downfall of the Highland clans. It led to the Highland clearances, which I'm going to talk about coming up quite soon. So if you want to talk about what if you want to hear about what happened next, please join my Highland Clearances tour. And we'll find out that almost up to 30, 40% 40 of Scotland lived in the Highlands at this point. And the whole cult culture was wiped out by the Brits. Scotland was called North Britain. It had a lasting effect in Edinburgh as well, because Edinburgh was a walled city, right? Edinburgh was a walled city from 1513 until 1767. Because of the failure of the Jacobite rebellions in 1746, that was it. That was considered the Jacobite rebellions over. Ah, that wee duck just attacked that big swan there. <laughs> so Bonnie Prince Charlie managed to escape the battle. He, he escaped or fled, depending on what version you believe. A £30,000 reward, reward was put upon Bonnie Prince Charlie's head and he was never, nobody stuck him in. He survived. He ran around Scotland for four, five months. Allegedly he was drinking a bottle of brandy a day. I don't know where he was getting the brandy from. And of course there's a famous, I'm trying to get a place for my gimbal to go on man, there's no way to put my gimbal. Of course there's a famous... A famous incident took place when Flora MacDonald helped, she dressed Bonnie Prince Charlie up as a waiter, as a fisher girl, a girl. She dressed Bonnie Prince Charlie up as a, a lady and sailed from US to Sky. She was actually a Hanoverian supporter. Flora MacDonald became a Hanoverian. I'm not sure which song it is. One, one second. Like a bird of wind, the sailors cry. Sing me a song. Oh, sorry about that. Bird
Thank you for that, everybody. Yeah, my singing skills are not the best, shall we say. <laughs> I like to sing, but nobody else likes it when I sing. I think the swans have been here since the lock was built in the Victorian period. This is called St Margaret's Lock. So Bonnie Prince Charlie died. He, he got picked up by the French, taken back to France. He actually got booted out of France because he was just a drunken embarrassment. So he went to his family's house in the Vatican before he died with an illegitimate daughter. And he's actually buried next to his father, who is buried in the, next to the first Pope, St. Peter, in the Vatican. So the next time you go to Vatican, say a wee prayer for Bonnie Prince Charlie and his dad. And just think about what might have happened if the Jacobites had won. The Napoleonic Wars would not have happened. The American Civil War might not have happened. So many historical events might not have happened if the Jacobites had won. So thank you so much, everybody. Please go on Mike's tour. Mike is in Dunbar just now. If you can leave a tip, please do so. If you can afford one. If you have already left a tip, thank you so much. If you could leave a five-star review, that would be fantastic. Also, add me as a friend on Facebook, Paul James Stewart. Share some postcards if you have some nice postcards on Voyagers or your own social media. And have the best day. And I'll see you tomorrow for my witches, bitches and damn rebel bitches tomorrow. Yes, Outlander. Oh, thank you, um, Tina, Grace. Thank you for sponsoring me. Was it you? <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you've all enjoyed the tour. Yes, I, I did not like... I watched Outlander Series 1 and Series 2, and when it got to Series 3, I did not like the actor who played Bonnie Prince Charlie, so I could not watch it. I'm going to have to start watching it again. Because, yeah, Outlander has a massive effect on Scotland. You know, regardless of the 
if you like Outlander or not, it has had a massive impact positively on positive, positively on Scottish tourism, believe it or not. So thank you so much, everybody. Take care, and I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, on my witches tour tomorrow. And please join Mike and Dumbar at 4 o'clock. And have the best day, everybody. And take care.